Jeremiah chapter 18. Now, I see a lot of strange faces there tonight. How many, if you're a visitor, not a member of this church, would you stand? Let's see where you're at. If you're a visitor with us tonight, if you're a visitor, visitors, please stand. Let's see where you're at. Okay. This bunch has come in from where? Where are you all from? Yeah. California. Yeah. <laughs> well, who, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven. Now, what's this? What is this? This is the girls' home across the way? Yeah. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Hey, you're okay so far. Anybody here from any further away than California? Where are you from, brother? Mexico. Yeah, that's right, brother. <laughs> oh, I thank you. Glad to have you here tonight. I hope you enjoy the services. Yeah, that depends on where that is in Mexico, you know, south of Tampico or Guadalajara or someplace. But California is a good way off. All right, this morning I mentioned something about George Washington's dream. And uh, I've got a copy of it here a fellow gave me. It's printed about 1970. And the source for this... Um, the account of this uh, vision was given in 1859 by a soldier named Anthony Sherman who fought with General Washington. And the account was reprinted in the U.S. War Veterans of Paper, the National Tribute in December 1880. The National Tribute is now the Stars and Stripes and was reprinted in the Stars and Stripes in December 21st, 1950. And it's quite lengthy and the, the end says this. And this time the dark shadowy angel turned his face southward, this is the vision he's supposed to have had, dream, from Africa. I saw an ill omened specter approach our land. It flitted slowly and heavily over every town in the city of the latter. The inhabitants presently set themselves in battle array against each other. As I continued looking, I saw a bright angel on whose brow rested a crown of light, in which was traced of the word union. He placed the flag between the divided nation and said, Remember your brethren. Again, I heard a mysterious voice saying, Son of Republic, look and learn. At this, the dark shadow angel placed a trumpet to his mouth and blew three distinct blasts. And taking water from the ocean, he sprinkled it upon Europe, Asia, and Africa. Then my eyes beheld a fearful scene from each of these continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Arose thick black clouds and were soon joined into one. And throughout this mass there gleamed a dark red light by which I saw hordes of armed men. These men moving with a cloud uh, came to America, which country was enveloped in a volume of cloud, and I dimly saw those vast armies devastate the whole country, burn the villages, towns, and cities which I had seen springing up. As my ears listened to the thudding of the cannon, the clashing of weapons, the shouts and cries of millions, I again heard the mysterious voice say, Son of Republic, look and learn. The dark shadow angel placed his trumpet once more to his mouth, and I blew, I blew a long, fearful blast. I saw a light as a thousand suns shone down from upon me and pierced and broke into fragments of the dark cloud that enveloped America. At the same time, the angel upon whose head still shone the word Union, who bore our flag in one hand a sword in the other, descended from heaven. These joined the inhabitants who I perceived were well nigh overcome, but who immediately took courage, again closing up their broken ranks, and renewed the battle. And then he goes on and talks about winning the war. That's the thing there. It, uh, it's been printed uh, several times in various publications. And he says the troops are from Asia, Africa, and Europe, and they're one, they're one group, and they got, they got a red light on them. They're red. All right, Jeremiah chapter 18, Jeremiah chapter 18. Uh, those troops are flying over your head right now. There are more than 150,000 foreign troops in America right now billeted in American installations, and you're paying the room and board. King George is not about the land, he's already landed. And those foreign troops, there are more foreign troops billed in the United States right now than we have foreign troops overseas. And they're from uh, Asia and Africa and Europe, which means they're Catholic and Muslim. That's the PLO and the Vatican. All right, so much for that cheerful opening. <laughs> uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. Now, Jeremiah chapter 18, there's a story there about a... Uh, Jeremiah trying to preach to the Jews and get them right, and they never do get right. And finally God has to come and destroy Jerusalem, and women got so hungry in the siege of Jerusalem, they ate their own children. You'll find that in Lamentations. And uh, Jeremiah preaches for many, many years to the Jews during the reigns of Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, and gets nowhere. And one time during that time here, he's in 
tells the Jews that they're to go down to the potter's house and look at something, and then let us learn some lessons from the from the potter. So I call this message, uh, let's go down to the potter's house. And uh, there's a number of things here we're going to find when we look at the passage. Uh, first of all, in verse 2, in verse 2 we have what we call the way. That's in verse 2. And the way into the potter's house, if you look at the passage, is down. Verse 1 and verse 2, he said, uh, Son of man, he says, uh, go down. Go down to the potter's house. And he goes down to the potter's house, and he watches the potter, and the potter's working on a wheel. And he wrought the work on a wheel. And then if you read the passage on down there further, he says, as the potter worked, uh, the, pot, the uh, uh, pot vessel he was working on was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made another vessel, as it seemed good unto him. He had charge of it, so he made the thing the way he wanted it. And uh, when that gets through, he tells the Jew that's a lesson for him. And the lesson he's to learn that is down there in verse uh, 6. And down there in verse 6, he's telling him that lesson that he learned from that is that uh, God is the potter, and the house of Israel is the clay. And as clay is in the hands of the potter, so the house of Israel, that's the nation of Israel, is in the hands of God. And our version of that is, uh, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. And of course, uh, the way some Christians sing it, you'd think sometimes they're singing, uh, I am the potter and you are the clay. <laughs> but uh, we're the clay. We're the clay. And the Lord is the potter. And uh, we're talking about going down the potter's house. The first item in it is, as you can see, down. You see that? Let's go down to the potter's house. The potter's house and the potter's field were down in the back end of Jerusalem. And uh, you remember they bought the potter's field for the burial of Judas Iscariot down by Gehenna. So the first thing you have to do is go down. Uh, if you're going to get in the wheel and God's going to do something with you, you have to come down. Uh, get off your high horse. Uh, you take uh, Paul, you know, God could do nothing with him until he knocked him flat, half blind for three days, then he could use him. And that's the law of life, the law of nature, and the law of the Bible. And I don't like that law. I care nothing about it myself, frankly. But that's just how it's set up. And God set it up so if he's going to use you and you're going to mount to anything, then you're going to have to come down. When he goes by Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus up a tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, he says, Zacchaeus, he says, come down. And uh, he doesn't uh, get to have dinner with Jesus at his house and welcome the Lord in until he's willing to come down. And he came down quickly, oh, Zacchaeus did, shinned down the tree. But the law of life is that if God's going to use you and do something with you, then he's the potter and you're the clay. That means uh, he molds you and he makes you. And that means he molds and makes you after his will. Not after you will. So we sing, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Hopefully. One well, of the ways is down. It's submission. It's submission to God. And uh, what we often do, and I say we, I've caught myself doing it, is we try to buy God off. Uh, we try to buy him, we try to, we try to offer him uh, our works instead of ourselves. Uh, what the Lord wants is you. Not your ministry. Not your work. I've known ministers a long time. God knows I have been in the ministry with ministers for a long time. I know ministers. And one of the very common, most common faults of ministers is they make a God out of their work. It's very natural to get thrown into it and get so concerned about it. You think it's the only thing in the world. And that's what's wrong with half these outfits. Each one of them thinks his ministry is just the greatest thing that ever was. And if you say against his ministry, well, then you're obviously the devil. And that stuff goes on all the time. We had some folks come to uh, Sunday school this morning. I don't know who they were. A couple ladies came. They sat down and opened their Bibles. And so I'd like them to get very interested in the lesson. And boy, just about the time I took one kick at Liberty Baptist College, oh, you know, and one at PCS, oh, out they went out the door. That's some of those tough Christians are going to die for Christ, you know. That bunch. Just couldn't take it. Couldn't stand it. Other stuff. Some folks just come to church and expect to get offended. <laughs> now the first thing you do is got to get off your high horse. Uh, no man ministry is the main thing. I mean, uh, there's a place for everybody. I believe there's a place for PCS. I sure do. 
I, th I, I sure do. I believe they do good work. I think they got high academic standards and teach discipline. I think that's excellent. I think they live have, have clean moral standards. Fine, there's a place for that. Sure there is. The thing is, they don't think there's any place for Ruckman. <laughs> but there is. <laughs> there, there's a place for me and there's a place for you. See? I mean, they, they, have their, they have their utility. I don't buy what they do, and when something's wrong, I'll point it out to you, but I, I'm, not, I'm not condemning the place. I'm not damning the place. Say it has no right to exist. Bob Jones University is a good school. It's a good school, a good college, the university. For a university, it's a good university. Let's just face it. They got good standards. They got a clean atmosphere, a good environment. Sure, man. Sure, there's a place for that. I wish every state had six colleges like Bob Jones. Really? I'm pending man that'll help. I don't care if it's for me or not. I couldn't give a flip less. I don't care who's for me or who isn't. Any idea. I'm indifferent to me. But we could, this country could use 20 colleges like that. We could use 50 colleges like that. Nothing to me. Folks, oh, Ruckman, Ruckman. Oh, Ruckman, your shirt. You know what you're talking about. You're just talking. Just blah, blah, blah. People think they ever think, every time I jump in something, people think I'm out there to kill them, you know, hate literature, that kind of stuff. I don't, I'm, I'm not that way. I, I think B.B. Uh, Baptist Bible College uh, fulfills a certain function, which is good, and uh, that we could use some more school like it. Uh, if you knew about the devil and about the, the world, what I know about, you'd appreciate anybody making any move in the right direction. I appreciate the Catholics trying to shut down the abortion clinics. That's, that's, a, that's, a, I'm not, that's a good move. I don't, I don't want to support it and promote it, but there's a place for it. Each in his own place. But the one thing for sure, you can't make a God out of your ministry. You can't make a God out of nothing else. And you can't buy God off with your, with your works. Uh, God doesn't want our works. He wants us. Amen. Son, listen. Son, give me thine heart. What he wants is you. Not just your service. You know what Paul says? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, I present your body, your body, he wants you. Your body, a living sacrifice. Now, modern Christianity has a way of getting around that. They say, let Christ come into your life. No, no. Let Christ come into your body, not your life. That life's an abstract, indefinite thing that's spreading out ahead of you, 20 or 30 or 40. Never mind that. Never mind that. What he wants is you. And what we try to do is try, we try to buy the Lord off with our, with our works. Look what I'm doing for you. Doesn't that take care of it? No. Look at the kind of results I'm getting. No, that don't take care of it. Now, if you're where God ought to, where God, if you're where God wants you, doing what God wants you to do the way he wants you to do it, you're going to have results. I'm not for these fruitless outfits, these hyper-dispensationalists and hyper-Calvinists that have nothing to show for years and years of bullshit and talk. And, but, but I'm not going to say that just the results, the ministry, the fruit is proof the thing's right. I'm not, that, I'm not that dumb. I mean, God can use all kinds of things. He used Baal and Bass to preach him a message. And what, what the Lord wants is he wants us. He wants us. I read a story one time about two boys they were brothers, and with one of these uh, things where uh, one boy, the oldest boy, was the uh, uh, more uh, delicate of the two boys, and he was about, oh, he was about 12, and the boy about 10 could beat him up. Boy 10 was a roughneck, and of course the kid about 10 years old enjoyed doing it to prove he was <laughs> bigger than the, uh, he was tougher than the older brother. It was a big, quite of an accomplishment for him. And the mother was a widow woman trying to raise those boys right and having a time with them. And as they got older, the fights got worse because they get older and tougher and smaller and do more damage. And when that mother tried to talk to that younger boy about it, he'd say he'd behave. He wouldn't pick any fight with his older brother anymore, but he did. Did it constantly. And she'd say, well, you're a hurt mother and you're a bothered mother and I have a such time worrying about you anyway. And you, you give me gray hairs and this and that and other thing. But he went, he went ahead and, and he probably wanted to do right. But he just couldn't resist uh, the temptation to knock the tar out of him <laughs> to prove how tough he was. I mean, look at me. I'm two years younger than he is, and I can handle him, see? And when the boys got to be about 15 to 17, then it got real, it got real vicious. And that mother, after one bad 
uh, run into those two boys. She called the younger boy in, and she said, I've talked to you, I've talked to you, and talked to you about this thing, and you're getting almost too old for me to whip you. And she said, you're going to wind up as a criminal if you're not careful. And you're supposed to be a Christian young boy, and he was. And she said, you know, me, me and I have tried to raise you boys right, and it's been difficult, the situation with just me and you and your brother. And she said, I want to have you know something. You've been a great burden to me and a great sorrow to me. And you've caught me a lot of anguish and a lot of prayer. And I wish you'd quit doing what you're doing and don't let, ever, let it happen again. You going to do it for me? And the boy said he would. And boy, about three weeks later, I had a brawl, and the older boy got his nose busted, that blood all over him, ruined a new shirt and this and that. And the woman came in, she mother came in, caught him right at the end of the fight. And when she came in, that younger brother looked up and saw her standing there, and he was just sweating, sweating off him, and or he skinned his knuckles hitting the older brother. And he just stood there and looked at her, and she looked at him, and she never said a word. Just never said a word. Went up and got the older boy and took him back, got him in the bathroom, washed him up, fixed him up, got some stuff for his nose, you know, and fixed things up the best way she could. And uh, never said a, a, not a word to that younger boy. And all that day, that younger boy would hang around his mother. And he'd say, Mama, can I help you in the kitchen? No, thank you. Can I cut some kindling for you, Mama? No, thank you. Can't do something to help you, mother? No, son. Whole day. After about five hours of that, that young boy came around just, just falling, just a tear running all over his face and said, Mama, I won't do it again. I won't do it again. I won't do it again, Mama. I promise you I won't do it again. And he got it right that time. He got it right that time. And it didn't happen again. So the boys became friends and things came out where they ought to come out. But see, the way, that's the way we are. Now, God, can I help you? You want me to do something for you? What can I do for you, Lord? Nothing. I want to serve you. I want to... No thanks. Isn't there something I can do for you? Sorry. Just let it go. Uh, until, uh, brethren, until it's settled with God, it isn't settled. Amen. Whatever it is. I don't care what it is. And the trouble of some of you folks, you look at that thing that isn't settled with God, you know the price of settling it. And you're not about to pay it. You're not about to pay it. And the Lord knows it. So, can I ready for service? No, thank you. I got all the help I need. That's the way. The way is down. Now, like I said before, I don't particularly care for that uh, passage. There's a lot in the Bible I don't care for at all. There's all kinds of verses in the Bible I don't care for a bit. I just seem to throw them out. I don't care nothing about them. <laughs> they aggravate the tar out of me. <laughs> but there they are. And the way for Gideon's, the way for, this is the vessel. He's making vessels here. This is the vessel. And you put the light under the vessel. There are pots that he uses, Gideon does. When you break the pottery, it clangs and clashes and then the light shines. But the light don't shine till the vessel's busted. That, I don't care for that one either. But it's there. And the truth of the matter is, uh, every time you pick up that Bible to get to read, you run into that kind of thing. You pick up the Bible and here's uh, this woman bowing at the feet of Jesus Christ. And she got this perfume. And she opens up this uh, perfume. She takes this alabaster box of ointment. She breaks that thing. And it's expensive. And old Judas Iscariot sees that thing bust, and he says, man, boy, I'm in American money. There goes about twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And he says, how come this waste was made? Might have been given to the poor. This he said not because he cared for the poor. That's the comment of the Holy Spirit. But because he was a thief and held the bag, he wasn't really burdened about those people. What he wanted to do is control the money. He had the bag. And that book says the love of money is the root. That's the root of all evil. And so you find that thing where this uh, woman is down here and she's breaking this alabaster box. She's down. She's on her hands and knees. And she's busting something valuable and giving to Jesus Christ what she's doing. And like I say, anytime you pick up the book, you keep running that thing all the time. Uh, 
it is, it is a matter of just serving God. It's belonging to God and being God's and being at God's disposal so that God can use you anytime, any place, anywhere for anything he wants to use you for. I had some homeless preachers come on the radio here years ago at, at a station we called WMEL. And that station isn't on anymore. I don't guess it. Is that still in town, WMEL? That was a uh, charismatic station I used to be on before I got on to, uh, I got on to uh, W, well, the one I was on all those years, the FM station. What was the name of that place? <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> and this WMEL before that, and then we're on another one now. They kind of shift me around to, to keep me in, as far back off the bushes as they can. But anyway, I was on WMEL, and that thing I heard a holiness preacher come there one morning and said, oh, he was all stirred up, you know, hallelujah and everything, and he's saying, glory to God, you know, well, folks, we're just going to, we're just going to just uh, praise God, get right here for a few minutes and serve God here for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> well, now, I know he meant well, but we're going to serve God for the next 30 minutes. Well, what's going what's gonna to do after the end of the 30 minutes? Though those charismatic people get all kinds of funny ways of saying things. They'll say, praise a -luya. You know, what a, what a thing, man. Praise a -luya, that kind of stuff. I heard one of them, a woman preacher, get on WMAL one time. She said, well, glory to God, friends. We're just so happy to have you here today. And a lot of our folks aren't here today, but we trust they're somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I guess they probably are somewhere at that, you know. All right, the first thing he says about this thing is you go down. And if there's any way to get the blessing of God and have God use you without coming down, I don't know what it is. You take, uh, you take Paul, God doesn't use him until he's unseated, knocked off his horse and flattened his back. And knocked flat on his back, he's blind for three days, and then God begins to use him. All right, that's the way. The way is down. Now there's something else about the text. In the text, notice in the same verse, verse 2, and he says, hear the words. And I'm going to speak to you. You got the way, and you got the words in verse 2. He says, go down to that uh, place down there, and you get down there, I'm going to tell you something. Won't have you listen to what I'm telling you. Hear my words. That's the best advice you ever got from anybody. I don't know who told you to first start reading the Bible or studying the Bible, but whoever told you to start reading that book and studying that book gave you the best advice you ever had in your life. Because if that book is what God actually said to people, that's the most important thing you possibly can get your hands on. Now, you know me, I don't I have no ifs and ands and buts about it, you know. When I say if that's uh, what God said, you know me. I mean, I believe that's what God said, and that's what God wants me to hear. And because that's what God said and God made me, I consider that book to be the most important item I've got in my house. Amen. Nothing takes precedence, or absolutely nothing, if that's what he said. Come on, folks, if that's what he said, isn't it pretty, pretty high class, isn't it? Well, you don't really believe that's what he said. <laughs> if you did, you'd spend some time with it. Now, who told you to get in that book? Well, whoever did was your friend. Uh, God's enemies don't tell you to get in that book and study it. They'll tell you all kinds of things, but they don't want you in that book. It's good advice. You say, well, why is it good advice? If I get put on the wheel, I have to come down, God may ruin me, and God may wreck me. He did this thing here. He, the vessel was marred in the hand of the potter. What if I get in the Lord's hand and it doesn't come out right? I've ruined my life. I'll be wasted. Well, you're going to be wasted anyway. <laughs> it's just a matter of who's going to waste you. <laughs> you want God to waste you, you want the world to waste you. That mess out there, I know what's in that mess out there. I've been out there 76 years, and I know what's going on out there. I think it beats you to death. Yep. Amen. Just driving Davis and Palafox will do it. <laughs> That's right, man. That thing now, it's just a question of where you're going to get worn down. You're going to get worn down. Amen. And it's a question of what you want. Mothers and daddies in America sometimes do some very foolish things. They have very foolish ambitions for their children. And it's natural, you ambitious for your children, you want your children to mount to something. But many a mother and daddy took their little boy or their girl and sacrificed their boy and girl, sacrificed their purity and their character and everything else on the altar of education. And this got to have a college education. You got to, why those colleges today are nothing but, but whorehouses. Amen. And the drug cartels on top of that. And there isn't a kid there that goes there that doesn't know that. If you don't know that, well, you talk to some 
Talk some Christian that's pulled out of an environment like this and then goes to some state college someplace and let him tell you what's going on. I don't have to even check it. I mean, I know what's going on. And men of mom and daddy are so anxious to get something. I'm not saying you shouldn't send your kid to college, see? Don't jump the gun on me every time. Listen to what I'm saying. But I'm saying many mothers and fathers do that. In plain words, they get over-anxious for their child to be a success. And they take their child and they get their child ahead in society or give them publicity or push them or make them prominent. They uh, expose them to things they didn't have to be exposed to. Now, if, uh, if God wants your child to have a college education, you've got the money for it, and your child knows what he wants to do and has prayed about it and feels God wants him to do this and that and other thing, and you've prayed about it and it's in line with the Word of God, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't tell anybody not the kid to send the kid to college. But you better make sure, you better make sure it's the will of God. You better make sure that uh, when that child goes there, the Holy Spirit, he's armed and sheltered and protected by the whole armor of God. You better be sure you know something about that book. Because they're going to go after that book like a rabid fox going after a rabbit, boy, when you get in there. And if you're, that's, if you're in the right place at the right time, God will take care of you in any kind of a mess. But don't expose yourself to a mess if you don't have to be exposed. Life will crush you, brethren. Life will crush you is what it'll do. And uh, the older you get, the more you see it. And the more you're going to see it. It'll wear you out. That's the law of entropy. Nothing evolves. Nothing evolves. Everything falls to pieces. <laughs> That's the law of life. And the question is, uh, are you, the marks you're going to get and the scars you're going to get, are you going to get them in the good fight so with Paul you can say, I fought a good fight? Or are you going to get your sword nicked in the wrong combat? That's the question. It's going to wear you out one way or another. Watchman Nee was a Chinaman, Chinese uh, devotional writer wrote very much like the people write that uh, teach in the Keswick Convention and the early Chautauquas we had in this country years ago. And Watchman Nee was, a, I mean by that, he wrote about the devotional life, the spiritual life, like Andrew Murray and that bunch, and uh, uh, Ruth Paxton, and uh, Maxwell. They write about the two natures and about uh, devotional material, and very good stuff. And Watchman Nee was in uh, prison camps in China, read Chinese for months at a time, then he'd get out. Then when he'd get out, they'd have him back in again very shortly. they have him back in. And Watchman Nee, one time one of his friends met him who hadn't seen him for about 20 years, and he said, I didn't recognize you right away. And he said, well, maybe not, since it's been about 20 years. He said, yeah, but you've aged so. He said, I was looking for a man about uh, 20 years younger than you. And he, when he told Watchman Nee that, Watchman Nee said, you know, that kind of hurt me thinking about that. And he said, I, got, I didn't let him know it, but he said, I, I got thinking about that, kind of hurt my ego, you know, thinking I'd age so quick and shouldn't have aged. And then he said, uh, I got thinking about it, and then I said to myself, what are you feeling sorry for yourself for? How did you age? <laughs> he aged being tortured in communist prisons. That's how he aged. Well, that's one way to age. The other way to age is to get out there and dissipate and carouse and mess around and get your gray hairs living like the devil yep. and worrying about your income and getting all this old money matters. Take your pick. Yep. Right. I mean, one way is good as another. This The juggernaut's going to roll over you anyway. Might as well make up your mind. The Bible says the, 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 the white head, the hoary head, the white head is a, crown, is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. The glory of young men is their strength. And the glory of old men is the white head. That's what he said. But he said in the way of righteousness, you can get gray hairs and white hairs worrying about stuff you have no business worrying about. You know, like the police looking for you, the FBI trying to lock you up or mess around with some guy's wife. There's all kinds of ways to get gray hairs and white hairs. Amen. Now take your pick. Take your pick. You want to get ground down either way. You can't miss. You are going to get ground down either way. Over there in India, they don't have it anymore, unless uh, way back there in the back end of nowhere, nobody can check on them. But over in India, for years and years, for centuries, they have what they call the juggernaut. And the juggernaut was a big idol. And that big idol was uh, carried uh, or pulled along down the street by uh, hundreds of people. It took them out to pull it. It was on wheels, wooden wheels and a platform, and it was an idol, an idol of a god, and underneath that juggernaut were rollers. They pulled it on, 
and those rollers had in glass and flint and stones embedded in them and they beat drums and roll that thing along the street, roll that thing down the street and they roll that thing down the street, they beat the drums and holler and scream and everything and they take all the old women and men and push them out in front of that thing and sometimes little babies and throw them out in front of the thing just let it run over them, mash them, kind of a a, a Medicare Hillary population control type of thing, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, Hitler showed them how to do it. And that thing is called a juggernaut. And that juggernaut would come across there and rolling across there like a tear away in tons with the hundreds and eighties pulling that thing and shouting and screaming and the drums beating and then kill all those people. That's a picture of the world. We'll take you and crush you underneath it, mash you flat, man. Now you say, well, I, you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, you know. That's the expression. Uh, listen, just sit down and wait, and you'll see the Joneses coming back in a while. <laughs> Don't worry about keeping up with them. Well, they'll come back. Uh, just give a little bit of time. Uh, wait till the stock market crashes, and you'll meet them all coming back. And they won't be worrying about their floppy disks and the Internet, you know, and their web and all this stuff, and all information data, you know, and all these are different kind of stocks they can buy. They'll be sweating blood, boy. Like a little modern daddy read the story of Cinderella to his little boy when he got through. He said, well, Dad, that, that, uh, that, uh, those golden slippers that uh, the prince gave to Cinderella, he said, was that, uh, was that capital gain or a gift? <laughs> That's the kind of, kind of world you're living in. Keep up with the Joneses. Keep up with the Joneses. You'll see them coming back. It'll get, get there for a while. Commerce will get you. Fashion will get you. Try to keep up with these rich folks the way they dress. Try to keep up with them the way they buy uh, things to play with. Big, big grown-ups toys. Try to keep up with them on the trips. Try to keep, keep your name in, in Vogue and Cosmopolitan and Esquire magazine and Fortune and Misfortune and this and that. And, and pretty soon you'll see what'll happen. The world will wear you out. The world will tear you to pieces. Love not the world, neither the thing in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, none of the Father, but the world, and the world, the lust thereof, passeth away, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Now there's something else about it. Come down there in verse 3, and in verse 3, notice the work. The work. He said, he went down there in verse 3, and behold, the potter, the potter wrought a work on the wheel. That is, he was making a piece of pottery. And he had a little table there that spins around. He puts his foot under the table like an old-time sewing machine and stomps his foot up and down and spins that thing around and gets that uh, clay going. And gets that clay going, then he takes, uh, takes his hands and takes various uh, primitive tools and uh, fashions him a piece of pottery out of that thing. And he's saying that's what he did. Uh, he wrought a work on the wheel. Now keep reading the, the account, and notice in the account it says, and the wheel was marred, or the, 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 the vessel was marred in the hands of the potter. It was a good potter, I guess it was a good potter, it's a picture of the Lord. But when he was doing something went wrong with the material. Uh, the, trouble wasn't with the, the trouble wasn't with the potter. The trouble was with the material that he had to work with. Uh, some parents send their kids down to school here thinking we're kind of a reform school. And that if we can just get a kid in the PBI, he'll straighten out. <laughs> this is not a reform school. This is a place for training Christian ministers and young people want to learn the Word of God. Amen. But they get the right kind of place for you to fix things up. And so, like a fellow said, preface, professor said, somebody throws a pile of lumber into your classroom and says, there, make furniture out of it. <laughs> Well, okay, if it's in, you know, grade C lumber and uh, isn't all termite infested. I mean, we, all I, what, what you, what you come, you, some of you come, I want to have to teach you. When you come, you come in whatever condition you come in. But I can't, I can't determine what kind of condition you're in. You're a condition before you got down here. I'll do what I can with you. I mean, I'll give you the stuff, but I can't, I can't turn you into a $20,000 rocking chair or something, you know, veneered and shellacked if, if, if the material isn't there in an earthquake out there in Long Beach, California a couple of years back a couple of newsboys were going through the rubble there and the, well, they were looking at a bunch of stuff because a lot of stuff the earthquake wasn't a bad one a lot of stuff hadn't even been bothered 
But they found a place there where a building just crumbled, just fell all over the place, the whole building. And these two newsboys were about, oh, about, you know, about 17 and 18 years old. And they're going there looking for the stuff, and one kid picked up a piece of stuff there and said, must be something in the mixture. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he didn't know nothing about mace or anything else, but he figured there must have been something wrong with the building that wouldn't have fallen down when all the rest of them didn't. And so there's something in the mixture. Now, maybe you have something in your personality, your background, your character that is faulty. When I say faulty, I don't mean uh, just the fact that you sin. We all, have, we all sin. We're all sinners. We all got that kind of no thing there. But you may have some special type of handicap, some special proclivity some special thing that's part I'm not I'm not a psychologist I'm not a, a philosopher but but I got but I, I know what how much you can, is true and some of that stuff is true uh, the trouble we have so many whining crybabies these days you can't tell what's true I mean every time every time a woman gets in a big mess she says I was abused when I was a girl my father molested me well maybe and maybe not sister I mean maybe you find a good way to get attention at your picture in the paper you never can tell these days but there's probably something to it um, there's bound to be something to it. This one here, if the, the vessel is marred in the potter's hands, the potter doesn't make any mistakes. Brethren, uh, the thing that's good in your life, God did, and the mistakes in your life, you made. <laughs> it isn't the potter trying to mess up the piece of pottery. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's the material he has to work with. And that material is pretty well formed by the time we go up. The mistakes are ours. And sometimes the Lord has to do a job over uh, sometimes, uh, three times, Bemis has a message on this passage. This, Nathan Bemis has a message on this, uh, on this passage much better than my message. Because Bemis spent some time in a, a pottery shop one time for several days taking notes. And he's got a thing on this thing here, and he tells how when a potter gets full of that piece of pottery, he gives it three tries before he throws it away. He gives it three tries. He try to make the thing. If it doesn't go wrong, he crumbles up the clay and then it starts all over again. And if it doesn't work, then he comes up and starts over again. And then the third time he treats some special stuff and starts all over again. If it doesn't work that time, out the window. And a pile of broken pottery out there. But three times in that thing, you try that thing out. The mistakes are ours. Uh, God has to sometimes go over, over and over thing to get it the way it ought to be. And the thing that he's working on doesn't appreciate it a bit. Uh, I'm sure that if... Uh, uh, my paper could talk, this paper. It'd have nothing for me but condemn, uh, condemnation. <laughs> it would say, what do you keep going over and over again for? Why do you have to keep doing that? I mean, you're scratching me, you're rubbing me, you're covering me, my beautiful white texture up, so why don't you just leave me alone? <laughs> uh, do you know how many times I have to paint a piece of, of painting when I'm painting on a thing? Back behind here, there's a baptistry. And every time I step back over to baptize somebody, I'm standing here like this, looking back across that thing this way, before I'd baptize him. The rock's too big, rock's too green, rock's too yellow. Rock should be further back, shadow's too dark, shadow's too light. Water's too blue, water ought to have green, water ought to have dark. I can, I, I go up that paint right and I make you 75 corrections. 75 of them, just like that. And some of those places I've painted over 18 times. <laughs> now if I have to do that with something like that, that's malleable and you can handle that doesn't resist. Boy, don't you know God has a time with some of us. Ooh. I mean, we're not like this paint that so just don't say nothing back. <laughs> I mean, the Lord tries to apply us. He gets all kinds of static. Amen? Amen. You know, I hope you'd buy that. <laughs> you ought to. All right, that's the work. A fellow said... Uh, I'm a self-made man. And a man knew him and said, yeah, you're a perfect example of unskilled labor. <laughs> you know, if I tell him I'm a self-made man, if I had to do it over again, I'd call him somebody else to do the job. A man said one time, I'm a self-made man. And a man who knew him said, that relieved the Lord of a great responsibility. <laughs> How true that is. One fellow said, if you could find the doctor that delivered you, you'd have a good case for malpractice. <laughs> It's marred in the potter's hand. He worked with the thing and something went wrong. We don't know what it was. Truman, Harry Truman was kicked out of West Point. And that made him over again, made a present out of him. <laughs> Peter, 
Peter Marshall, Peter Marshall, the the uh, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate for years and years, the save Presbyterian, the Scotch Presbyterian. Peter Marshall was kicked out of the Navy when he was 15 years old. He lied to get in, and they caught him and kicked him out. God had to make him, make him over, do something else with him. You take uh, Einstein was making 60 cents an hour in American money at a dry goods store coming up, and he could hardly even speak till he was four years old. And if what sometimes something goes wrong, and he says the potter made it over again another vessel as it seemed good to him. And that's the work. The work of the potter's work, more than the hand of the potter, and he made it over again as it seemed good to him. Now come on down. And uh, oh, he want to work in the potter's on the, on the thing, and then we have the waste in the passage in verse 4. Marred. And he quit, he quit, he quit working on that particular one. That is, what he was going to do with that piece of pottery, he never did. Sin never leaves a man better than it finds him. Uh, think what you or I could have been if we'd obeyed God the whole way. Wonder how different our lives would be. One of the biggest disappointments you'll have in your life is see your children grow up. They don't meet your expectations after you plan for them. And maybe give them good advice. And maybe give them a good example. Though not always, but good example in some things. They don't pay attention to it. And they grow up and they break your heart, grow up. They wonder, wonder how in the world they ever turn out like that. And those things happen. And you wonder sometimes, what would happen if we, you and me, from the very start, from birth right on, all the way up, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, what if we just done right every time? My, what a, what a, what a mess sin makes of a family. Sin. I'm not one of these family of value, Gulf Coast people type of fellows. I call it sin. Well, these fellows, these family value people, it's always lack of communication, lack of understanding, lack of this and that, lack of cooperation. It's sin. Amen. Sin. Amen. Mess up your kids. Mess up your wife. Mess you up. It'd be a wonderful thing if we just come in right and start right and go right all the way, how different things might have been. But you can't daydream. You have to deal with them where they are. And in this case here, the potter does the only thing that a potter should do. He says, well, I can't do what I want to do with that thing because the material is not yielding. It's not yielding to the wheel. It's not yielding to my shaping. It's not yielding to my instruments. I've got, I can't make the, I can't make the material do what I want it to do. Uh, I've worked with paints that won't do what you want them to do. I've worked with brushes that do what you want them to do. You guys that you're out in jobs with tools, you, you've come to this stuff all the time. You come to this stuff with material you can't handle. It won't react the way you want it to react. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's how it is with, with, with us and God. So he says he made another one as it seemed good. Now what's the problem with that material? Well, from a human standpoint, uh, I suppose, no commitment. And when we give all the calls, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to commit themselves. We're trying to get a decision. Where the, uh, the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying the decisions are all valid or all of them stick. I'm not that dumb. But something ought to be, ought to be you got, ought to get used to taking yourself from time to time and in a definite act, turning yourself over to God Amen. and reminding yourself of it and keep reminding yourself of it. A fellow says, well, it doesn't do any good. Sure it does some good. A bath does some good. For a while, <laughs> for a while, I don't think, I don't think one trip down the altar in a year is going to fix everything. I don't believe that for a minute. But I'll tell you, eight or nine of them will sure help. They'll sure help. They'll remind you of what you intend to do. Even if you don't do it, it's a reminder that you intend to and you want to. Amen? Amen. Well, God is no, God is no cruel torture master or something. You think he doesn't know that? You think God doesn't know when you want to do right? We've been tempted. I don't know what the thing is. What I, it's a, a lack of commitment, a lack of selling out, a lack of just abandonment to God. One time a fellow went overseas and he was with a tourist group that toured someplace over in Africa and they were 
showed me the environmental native stuff and all this, that, and the other thing. And when he was over there, he came across a schoolmate that he'd known about 20 years earlier, and he was shocked. And he said to the schoolmate, he said, what are you doing out here in the bushes? He said, uh, I'm preaching the gospel to these people. And he said, where do you live? And he pointed to one of the shacks over there, those straw shacks, just like the natives lived in, and said, I live over there. And his friend whistled through his teeth, you know, he's a businessman back in America, made good money. And he whistled through his teeth and said, you know something? He said, well, I wouldn't take a million dollars for what you're doing. And the missionary said, I wouldn't either. <laughs> He wasn't doing it for a million dollars. He's doing it for the Lord. Amen. You say, what is that? Commitment, 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 commitment. And with there's commitment, then the vessel is going to have a chance to come out right. And where there's no commitment, then it could be marred in the potter's hand. And so he wrought a work, the potter did. The water potter wrought a work and it was marred in his hand, so he made it over again as a different, as a different pot. Uh, years ago in a Presbyterian board of mission, they run and, uh, and, and uh, examine a young woman who wanted to be called the mission field. They didn't take a lot of single women, very few of them, as few as they could, but when a man couldn't do the job, they'd get a woman to do it. And before this young lady came before the mission board, the fellow who taught her in her seminary at the school where she went to said, uh, <coughs> I hear you're going to examine uh, Miss So-and-so for the mission field. They said, yes, we are. And he said, well, be sure and ask her, examine her uh, carefully about the atonement of Christ. He said, uh, you'll find that young lady has some very peculiar ideas about the atonement. And they thought, well, we'll certainly do that. We're not going to uh, have a liberal missionary out here in the foreign field that doesn't believe in the blood atonement of Christ. So when they came in there, they, the first question they asked her, uh, they said, uh, do you believe that uh, Jesus Christ uh, loved people enough to die for, die for them? And she said, yes. They said, what else do you believe? She said, I believe we should uh, do that too. <laughs> that was her peculiar belief about the atonement. She believed if he loved you enough to die for you, that you ought to love folks enough to die for them. Amen. You say, well, that, that's, that's commitment. That's getting sold out. Like I talked to you about this morning, it's that lack of enthusiasm, I guess, or whatever it is, of just, of just selling all out. I don't, uh, I don't know what you're counting on to save you, and I imagine most of you folks are saved. I don't know how you stand with some of these things, but I'll tell you what I stand exactly. I bet my soul on what that book says. Amen. That's place your bets. Amen. The lives of my wife, my children, the ministry, and my soul is dependent on what that book says. Amen. And if that book's a lie, I'm, a, I'm dead meat. Because I don't trust anything else or anybody else. Amen. You say, so what? I'm committed. Nothing to turn back and redo. I'm gone, man. I'm gone. I'm gone. And it's just too bad I didn't get gone earlier. I wasted a lot of years. Made a lot of messes. I wasn't on the wheel. I was shaping myself. <laughs> Self-made man. Boy, what a product. <laughs> God help us. <laughs> Are you on the wheel? Let's go down to the potter's house. Get on the wheel. We've had students come here like that. We had students come here, we did all we could for them. Always gave them a break. We've never run off any student quickly. We've never run off any student. That's right. We never have. We, we, we don't ship them like these other schools, you know. They don't use the, they get demerits for parking the wrong parking lot, and making a long distance call at night, all that baloney. We don't even fool that stuff. If I get messes up, we either give them a break. You either give them more than one break. You say, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make a vessel fit for the Lord's use. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's, there's a tragedy in human character here, and a tragedy in moral character, and a tragedy in the ministry, and fellows who wanted to serve God get uh, put slap out of the ministry. I, I'm not going to mention the names because of their own master a man stands or falls. So it's really none of my business. But I could write a book I could write a book. I, I could write a book of fellows who were premillennial, fundamental, King James, Bible-believing, once married, soul-winning, pastors and evangelists, who just made a perfect mess of it, and they're gone, they're car salesmen, insurance salesmen, and that was the end of it. Make a list of them. Many of my personal friends. 
I say many of them, I say out of 40, 10 of them. You say, what is it? The vessel's marred. It's marred. Well, doesn't mean the Lord's all through with him. I mean, he'll use the fellow as a witness someplace else. I'll get his bills paid for him. Be merciful to him, his family. This doesn't mean God's going to take you and throw you out in the junkyard. You're saved. You're his child. But it, it, he can't get the vessel he wanted. He wanted. All right, now that's the waste. And I've seen that, oh, I've seen that waste. Young men come here. And then just waste the money and waste the time and everything else. Just wind up in worse shape when they came. And I don't know what to do about it. We do what we can about it. And teach them and try to teach them right. But we cannot uh, do something with the equipment if the equipment isn't there. All right, then we have this in the passage. In verse 6, in verse 6, in verse 6, we have the will. And the will is God's. Thus saith the Lord, O house of Israel, can I not do with you like this potter is doing with this clay? He said, have I got power, the power this potter has over the clay, have I got that power over you? Yeah, it's his will. Folks say, not my will, but thine be done. Don't you worry, it will be. Our job is lining up with it. Our job is, is lining up with God's will. He's going to have his will. And our job is to line up with it. And we sing, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. That's his will. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Are you yielded? Is God running your life? How much of it does he run? How much of it does he run? Uh, you folks up in your 40s and 50s and 60s up in there, let me ask you something. How much of your life has God done and you haven't had your hands on it? How much was his planning and how much of it was your planning? I will tell you right now, one of, the greatest, one of the greatest blessings in life is to get up around my age and look back and see where God did this and God did that and God did this and God did that and God did this and God did that without you putting your cotton pick and hand on it one time. And my will wasn't even a factor. Matter of fact, in most of it, it had been just the opposite of my will. <laughs> Most of my will is going this way, and God's going that way. But it sure is a blessing to get to the end and see how much he had his hand on, and how little I had mine on. And of course, as the years go by, it gets more and more that way, because you don't, you don't have the strength to get your hand on it anymore. And that's good, too. I'm for that, too. That's a blessing. Years ago, up in, uh, in a, my, the Moody uh, Bible Institute, and up there around Chicago, and the in the mission there where the uh, Pacific Garden mission was. A fellow came in there, a businessman came in there. This was up at all in the 1940s someplace. And he'd come there almost uh, every night to sit back in the back and do nothing, never respond to the invitation, to sit back there and listen real carefully. And he listened, was attentive. And he wasn't a bum. He was a visitor, evidently a, a pretty good businessman. He didn't dress too uh, sharp for that end of town, but he could tell he had the, he had the threads. And one night the missionary superintendent walked up to the mission superintendent and introduced himself and asked who he was, told him who he was, asked him what he was doing there and told him who, why, what he was doing there, said he liked to hear the gospel. And the missionary superintendent asked if he was saved, and the man said no, he wasn't. And he said, you ever think about getting saved? He said, yes, he did. And he said, well, the next time the invitation is given, why don't you come down there and accept Christ your Savior? He said, I can't. And he said, why not? And the fellow said, well, I'm a, a millionaire. They said, I own several thousand acres of wheat out in uh, Kansas. And he said, I've been through this thing a number of times before with the Lord. And the Lord told me if I ever got saved, I'd have to give him a tenth of my income. And he said, well, you don't have to, but that's a good thing to do. He said, well, I'm not about to give a tenth of my income to the Lord. And the mission superintendent said, well, then die without Christ and go to hell. <laughs> he walked out. And the next night he was back. And after about four or five weeks that, the mission superintendent came to him and said, uh, Sir, why don't you get settled about this thing except Christ? He said, uh, I'm going to have to give up my wealth if I do. I'm going to have to. I know I'm going to have to. As soon as I get to give it up, and I just can't give it up. And he said, Would you rather go to hell with it or go to heaven without it? And he said, Well, I, I, I know you're right, but he said, You don't understand. And he said, Well, what is it? And this is the story he told him. He said, Well, back in the Depression, he said, I lived up here along these shores here. I'd... Uh, 
supervise my farmers and workers out in Kansas and then get come up here in, in the summertime, you know, and go out here in the lake and stuff. And he said, when the bottom dropped out in 1929, he said, I wasn't real rich then. And he said, but I lost what I had. And he said, I was up here and I was almost down here ready for your rescue mission. And he said, I'd go up down the waterfront here and I'd see yachts parked off on the Lake Michigan there about oh, 100 yards, 200 yards. And I could see lights on the yachts and hear the sound of music and dancing. And he said, somebody in the Depression had plenty of money. And he said, it wasn't me. And he said, you know what people do? He said, they'd eat up there. And he said, a couple of times, uh, one of those yachts would kind of drift by close to shore, maybe, oh, uh, 50 yards offshore. And I'd see people throwing stuff off the boat. And he said, a little later, I'd know to wash up there on the shore and some of these steaks were about a half eaten. And he said, I used to go down and pick up those steaks and I'd eat those things. And he said, I made up my mind if I ever made a mess of money and got real rich, I'd do that. I'd just eat meat and eat a half, half sirloin steak and throw it away. And he said, I've got the money now, but I'm miserable. <laughs> and the fellow said, you need to get saved and quit worrying about that. And he said, the Lord uh, owns a cattle of a thousand hills. And he said, the Lord knows where every hair in your head is. And he said, you'll just trust God and take a chance. And he did. He got saved. And he got saved. And the fellow hadn't been saved two weeks. Then he got some kind of a telegram from West Kansas and said, crop wiped out with grasshoppers. Clean the thing out. I'm 1,200 acres. Just <laughs> blap. <laughs> and that mission superintendent, when he saw the guy the next night come in, he thought, boy, what a test for a new Christian. And he said he was scared to death. I thought he was going to lose his faith now. He's going to wind up a bum or something. And he was real nervous about it. He came back to the fellow and said, how's everything going? The man said, fine. Praise the Lord. God's good. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, did you, I've heard about what happened. Did you get the news? Yeah, I got a telegram. He said, I'm wiped out. Uh, grasshopper hit a ball in my pasture. He said, well, uh, how do you feel about that? He said, well, nothing. He said, if he knows the hairs of my head are and all that stuff, he knows where all the grasshoppers are, all the wheat is, and if the Lord wants to pasture his grasshoppers and his wheat, that's his business. <laughs> now that old boy's on the wheel. He's on the wheel, boy. And if the Lord wants to pasture his grasshoppers, there he is, right? On his wheat, right? Amen. See, he got it. <laughs> but boy, that's a tough cookie there. You know what that is? That's being on the wheel. Are you on the wheel? Please ask his 11. Remember now that I created in the days of thy youth, and the evil days come not upon thee. Nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Are you on the wheel? Is he molding your life? Is he making it? Or are you molding making it? Years ago in a grade school, a Christian grade school, a teacher had trouble with a little boy there, about 10 years old, always messing up on purpose, not doing his work right. And they're going to have exhibit of the children's work there for the parents to come and see and put it up and show what they'd done. And that little boy was going to have nothing. He just had a big mess. And that Christian teacher had been working that boy for about a year. And he was a, was a Christian school, but that boy wasn't a Christian. Kind of like some of the other Christian schools, they, have, they take uh, anybody along, or they subscribe to the Apostles' Creed, or not even that. And that little boy had uh, been dealt with by that teacher, she's a Christian teacher, and loved him, and trying to win him to Christ. And the time came to them to display their works to their parents, and that boy was sweating blood, didn't know what to do, and the teacher saw he was just nervous, a cat in a room full of rocking chairs, but she didn't say anything to him. And the day came and all the pupil stuff was on exhibit in the hallway and pinned up and pasted up, you know, on their workbooks and everything and their projects and all that stuff. And the parents came in, and this boy's parents came in, and they started down by the stuff, and she was showing the different stuff. They're going to get the, uh, their boys work in a minute. And that 10-year-old boy was right between mom and daddy just, <laughs> thought he thought doomsday had come. And when they got down, that boy's exhibit was all cleared up and all nice and neat and everything just in order. I went on down the hallway, and that little boy was just, he knew that wasn't his work. <laughs> that thing was over. He went back, and after Mom and Daddy went on home, he went back to his teacher and said, uh, did you do that? And she said, yes. 
She said, I fixed it up so it looked good. And he said, well, where'd you learn how to do that? And she said, Jesus taught me how to take those ugly things and cover them up so it looks so bad. And she led him to Christ. The Lord knows how to take the ugly things and cover them up so it looks so bad. And he makes it over, makes it over. You can't miss with the Lord. The question is, how much of your life was yours and how much was his? I haven't run a lot of my old companions since I was saved, a few of them. Uh, Bill Hendricks, who I played in the country western band with here in town, I run into him. And Buddy Pelham, they finally got him for bad checks. He had another country western band we played here in town. And Ed Lake, an announcer I used to know, if he's still alive, he's talked with him. And uh, Russell Hirsch, who's dead now. And Leroy Morris, who had a gland trouble, he weighed about 300 and 70 pounds, something like that, I had gland trouble, and he's dead and he's gone now. And I, I'm one of the few of those fellows from time to time, a fellow named Feinberg I went to the University of Kansas with, uh, ROTC fellow from World War II. A few of those fellows aren't in from time to time. Aloys and Josiah's a couple of old Catholic buddies. Uh, they're still floating around, about half dead. Last time I saw Russell Hurst, he was in his 50s. He was behind the console at a radio station there. Oh, up on the EAR or COA, one of those sitting there, ALA, one of them, and sitting there with his cup of coffee shaking and cigarette box all over the place. And he's dead now, those fellows. And I remember right after I got saved, I came back here to Pensacola, and not right after I got saved, but about three years after I got saved, I came back and got on radio where I'd been an announcer for years, WAR, back when uh, Irving Welsh was the manager there. And I got in there and began to preach, and I looked back behind, and back behind the console there it was Ed Lake sitting back there like he was just when I got saved and left years, a couple of years ago. And I remember looking through that, that glass window, that gate console, and looking at Ed Lake and Russell Hirsch and those fellows, and I thought to myself, my God, what God got me out of. When I left, when I was left, I was making good money, and I went from... $80 a week to $30 a week when I got saved. G.I. Bill went off living a plywood trailer with my family. And that bunch made fun of me when I left. But you're getting write-ups in national radio magazines, you ought to stick with it. I looked at them, there they were back there getting older. The world was wearing them out just like it was me. But the world was wearing them out. The Lord was wearing me out. There's a difference, boy. There's a difference. And they're back there shaking and just heading on the last peg man and there. Is that Lake still alive? Is he still around? Do you know him? Yeah. I haven't checked on him recently. But he's up in years. And I know what those fellas have been doing. Spinning that table. Playing them discs. Punching the cassettes. Punching the CDs. And then bang, boom, bang, boom, 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 with a room full of smoke and coffee. My God, people. You know what I've been doing? Flying DC-10s around. Going to Marriott Hotel, and the guy says, charge all your meals. <laughs> but that God's plan, I never planned any of it. I went to Bob Jones to get a master in radio arts. I didn't go there to learn how to preach. Good thing I didn't. <laughs> how much of it is the Lord's? How much is yours? One time a little girl who was disformed, disfigured in her face, said to her mother when she got to be about eight years old, she said, Mama, she said, why did God make all the little, all the little girls pretty and didn't make me pretty? And her mother said, well, honey, God isn't through making you yet. Amen. That's right. God isn't through with us till we get up there in, in glory. Amen. You wait till you see us then. Yeah, One time back in the days when street cars and trolley cars were running, and people used to ride them, a young lady got on a street car, and she was driving along there in a street car, and she had a man, an elderly man, about, oh, 70 somewhere, got in, uh, sat up a couple of seats ahead of her, and had a beautiful bouquet of flowers on him. And the most gorgeous flower she ever seen in her life. Seen nothing like it, even, even on a florist store. 
and she kept looking at them and looking at them, and she just couldn't help it. She loved flowers, and these were beautiful flowers. And the old man, he couldn't help but notice she was staring at him all the time. And finally he got up and came back to the seat, sat down next to her and said, Young lady, would you like to have these flowers? And she said, Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean to be covetous. I didn't mean, I'm sorry, no. And he said, Well, I noticed you admire them. And he said, They are beautiful, aren't they? She said, Oh, they're just gorgeous. He said, Well, uh, I'd be glad to give them to you if you want them. She said, Oh, no, I couldn't do that from a stranger. He said, uh, That's perfectly all right. He said, I was going to give them to somebody else, but I think you'd appreciate them uh, uh, more than they would. And she said, well, if, if, if it's you sure it's all right, he said, here, and gave them to her. And then rang the bell there and got off the next crossing. And as that streetcar pulled away, that one of those beautiful flowers looked out the window and saw that fella. He's heading across to the cemetery. He's going to leave them to his wife. But he figured a, a live woman could probably use them better than a dead woman could. But he got them for his wife. God got you. He wants you. He'll use you. He doesn't want you dead. He wants you alive. I beseech you by the mercy of God present your body a living sacrifice. Amen. Don't give it to a corpse. That corpse is the man you were before you were saved. Right. You're dead. You're dead. Romans chapter. Don't give it to him. Give it to the Lord. I don't have any secrets of success. I don't know what they are. I couldn't even tell you. I just know that most of my adult life, at least since I've been saved, God called all the shots. And I didn't call half a dozen. I didn't call half a dozen out of eight or nine thousand. And I'm glad I didn't. Because like I told you before, if I've learned one thing in this, sir, if I've learned I'm not smart enough to run my life. It can't be done. I don't have any secrets. Some of you folks could do a better job than I could of all kinds of things in the ministry. All other kind of things in the, in the Lord's work. But what I can do, I'll do for him. God's got of me all there is to have. That's the best I've got. It's a rotten job, tough apples. I couldn't do any better. And that's where I stand. I'm not a very good writer. My grammar is terrible. And I don't know nothing about punctuation and spelling at all. But I'll write for the Lord. My art works no good. That's just a sketch. That's just a sketch and a very good one at that. Hands are too big, head's too big, shoulders too stoop, body isn't long enough, not enough light coming to the window and 40 other things. But what I can do, he, he's got. I want to ask you just one thing, brethren. Has he got all of you there is to get? One other thing. If you drop dead tonight and go and be the Lord, could you stand there and look him in the face and say, Lord, that is the best I could do under the circumstances. Of course, you're not supposed to be under the circumstances. But you have to operate under certain conditions. That's the best I could do. And here the Lord say, well, it's a lousy job. <laughs> and I'll say, well, maybe that's so. But don't send me back again because I couldn't do it any better. And if you send me back again, I'll make a bigger mess than the first time. <laughs> done your best. That's all you can do. If you haven't done that, you're not on a wheel. You run your own machine. Father, Bless your word tonight. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded, still. Lord, forgive us for the time we bucked. And we sure bucked. And fretted and fussed and fumed and sold and resisted what came our way because we figured it just had to be of the devil because it didn't please us. I don't know how many times I've made mistakes along these lines. I, I don't know. I wouldn't care to count them. But Lord, we, we mean well like Paul. We mean well. We'd like to please you. We want to be healed. 
these young people want to be. These kids that come to our school down here, I have no doubt that not one out of ten came here with a bad motive in mind. Not one out of twenty. Maybe not even one out of fifty. Maybe this couldn't work for them. Maybe the, the, something wrong with the material. Whatever it is, we know we're responsible. We're a damnic. We got ourselves in this mess. You didn't, you didn't make this mess. We made it. We made it. We have to live with it and work with it. Now, Lord, I pray you might speak to your people here tonight, especially the young people that are kind of tossing things around and deciding how they're going to wear out. Seeking pleasure and seeking fun and seeking sin or wear out serving you and trying to please you. They're going to wear out either way. They're going to get old. The body's going to fall apart. They're going to lose their hair. They're going to lose their teeth as time goes by. They're going to use their youth, their freshness. These beautiful young ladies will lose their beauty after a while. Get old, wrinkled, gray-headed as time goes by. Nature will take its course. And God may they have the faces when they get up in years of people who've been on the wheel. May they heed the warning you gave them in this chapter in chapter 11. You said, I frame evil against you. You're talking about Israel, and you, you sure fixed them. And you sure could sure fix any one of us. Now let's remain in prayer a while. Got a number here down the hour. I want to have a little time, a dedication here before we leave here tonight. And if you're unsaved, I want you to get out of your seat and come here to the front and join us. If you're unsaved and like to receive Christ, come and join us anywhere in the building. Get up and come on. And if you're already down here at the front, if you're down here at the front, you're not saved, would you raise your hand? Let us see where you're at. You came, if you came to receive Christ, if you want to receive Christ, would you raise your hand down here at the altar? And if you're not down here, would you come down and join us? While you're coming tonight, say, Ruckman, I'm going to accept Christ my Savior. Come ahead. Come ahead. And in a minute we're going to stand and sing, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, if thou art the potter. And brother, sister, we are the clay. Father, thank you for many blessings in life. Thanks for the years and years of protection, and care, and mercy, long kindness and suffering, gentleness, luxuries, which we don't deserve. And Lord, if we're not pleasing your sight right now, what we're doing, help us to quit it. For something we're not doing, we should be doing, show us what it is. I don't want to walk in darkness. I don't want to resist your will anywhere. Give us light. Give us light. And God, give us the courage and the moral backbone to follow it when you give it to us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Let's turn to, what number is this? 388. Let's turn to 388 in the hymnal, people. 388, let's stand, let's all stand and sing him 388. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Sing it out. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, 